your data. Unfortunately, the proposed uh, framework suffers from a major structural uh, flaw. Our current concern stems from the fact that the proposed framework is not limited to ensuring the adoption of shared technical standards for all financial institutions across the country, but also sets out a singular mandatory framework for federally regulated financial institutions and uh, one that is uh, uh, optional for provincial institutions. But by the government's own admission, the, the sector covered is of mixed jurisdiction, and there will be an overlap of the frameworks between jurisdictions that fall more under provincial jurisdiction. Although the uh, adoption of the framework is theoretically voluntary, they will have no other choice but to uh, adhere to it because of competitiveness and uh, risk management reasons. <clears throat> so the current bill, as I said, has a major structural flaw, and this must be corrected as quickly as possible. The government must uh, avoid getting off on the wrong foot in order to remain relevant for consumers and all of the financial sector <clears throat> and consumers. As a a, as a financial institution of uh, importance, uh, the, and that we have the majority of our, our activities fall under provincial jurisdiction, this overlap between the federal and provincial frameworks is counterproductive and, and harms co competitiveness. The adoption of this bill in its current form might undermine the confidence of users, which is an essential, which is a crucial component for the success and proper functioning of, of the proposed system. A two-speed system will disadvantage consumers and will represent an obstacle to a cohesive experience for consumers, will limit competition, and will undermine the credibility of the initiative. The Desjardins Group supports the establishment of a framework that will allow the consumer to control how their data is shared. In order to do this, uh, corrections need to be made quickly to the governance and structure to maintain momentum and avoid future delays. In the circumstance, under these circumstances, committee members, we are asking the government to withdraw uh, Section 16 of Part 4 of Bill C-69 and to make it an independent bill so that the proposed framework can benefit from in-depth analysis, allowing all stakeholders affected, the public sector, for, and provincial and, and government governments and authorities can be consulted in order to create an aligned vision and a shared understanding of the system. Thank you for your attention. I would be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you, M Mr. Brun. Now we'll hear from the Canadian Health Food Association. I believe it's uh, Mr. Skelton that will be delivering remarks. Yes, please. Bonjour. Thank you, Chair and members of this committee for having me here today. My name is Aaron Skelton and I'm the President and CEO of the Canadian Health Food Association, a trade association representing natural health, organic and wellness products in Canada. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak before you today, not just on behalf of our member companies, but on behalf of the 82% of Canadians that use natural health products as part of their health and well-being. The core concern I am bringing to you today is regarding Health Canada's continued abuse of parliamentary process. Health Canada has introduced significant amendments to the laws governing natural health products through budget omnibus bills in both 2023 and 2024, rather than following parliamentary process. This has undone the hard work of prior legislative reviews conducted by previous parliaments and the House of Commons Standing Committee on Health. In Budget 2024, current amendments to the Food and Drug Act, as included under Division 31 of Bill C-69, has yet again caught an entire industry completely off guard. For the second time in as many years, Health Canada has attempted to evade proper parliamentary process including scrutiny by the Standing Committee on Health and consultations with industry to achieve their desired outcome with zero checks or balances. The amendments they seek as part of Division 31 are extremely powerful. And however altruistic the intentions behind it are framed, the implications of such broad sweeping changes demand proper study and regulatory rigor. As mentioned, the same approach was taken in 2023 when Division 27 Part 4 of Bill C-47 shockingly changed the definition of therapeutic products to include natural health products with no scrutiny, public analysis, or industry consultation. 
the lack of transparency and the unintended consequences that came from a blatant disregard of due process have resulted in a private member's bill, Bill C-368, that just this week passed second reading with support from all opposition parties to repeal this amendment. While a step in the right direction to course correct a sneaky tactic, once an amendment has passed, it is no easy feat to undo what was inappropriately done. The need for industry and consumers to voice their concerns on important regulatory and legislative matters is paramount, a requirement that is crucial to the development of fair and appropriate regulations. The potential impact of unchecked powers is not a hypothetical one. The current cost recovery proposal for NHPs, the outcome of such ministerial powers, has already created a staggering and untenable situation for companies across our sector. Today, we are back to ask this committee to not let history repeat itself. To be clear, we represent the natural health product industry. We do not represent any smoking cessation or tobacco products. We are here because over the course of the past two years, our trust in Health Canada has been eroded. We have faced multiple regulatory and legislative changes that have serious consequences on an industry and on Canadians. If Bill C-69 passes and this amendment goes through health products, natural or otherwise, will be left to face broad sweeping powers from a minister that will have the ability to issue orders without following the Statutory Instruments Act. As a first of its kind, we have no visibility into the evidence required to support an order and we will be left in the dark as to whether or not these powers can override department issued licenses such as those granted by the Natural and Non-Prescription Health Directorate. As an industry, we continue to support regulation and legislation that protects Canadians and is developed in a transparent, responsible, and appropriate manner. Regulatory amendments pushed through omnibus bills do not reflect this value. Today, we ask this committee to consider removing Division 31 from this Act. This committee amended the budget in 2017 and we urge you to consider this precedent here. The restrictions Division 31 places on health products, including natural health products, have consequences beyond what the current Minister of Health has communicated. With the powers of this, um, uh, with the power of this and no due process, Health Canada has made themselves the judge, the jury, and potentially the executioner. We cannot understate the need to approach regulatory changes of this nature and this magnitude in the proper way, with study, analysis, and consultation. I thank you again for your time, and I am happy to answer questions you might have. Uh, Mr. Skelton, and uh, now we'll hear from the Mining Association of Canada, and uh, Mr. Grattan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered on the unceded territory of the, uh, of the Algonquin people. I appeared before the Senate Energy, Environment, and Natural Resources Committee on Tuesday as part of its pre-study of amendments to the Impact Assessment Act contained in this bill. Max Senate Committee brief has been submitted to your clerk for distribution, so expect that soon. Today I will focus my remarks on two aspects. The first is the proposed Clean Technology Manufacturing Investment Tax Credit, which even as an acronym is a mouthful. Um, the mining sector welcomes the government's efforts to build a critical minerals value chain and seize what has been described as a generational opportunity for Canada. The tax credit, if expanded and implemented correctly, could secure Canada's place as a reliable, responsible, critical mineral supplier to our trading partners and the North American su supply chain that is getting built. In its current form, however, it falls short to properly tackle the major challenge facing industry which is having enough critical mineral supply to feed the various supply chains. It will thus not achieve our national objective to attract the necessary significant capital investment to support our energy transformation and security. We have seen lots of news about new investments in battery plants and electric vehicles. We have read a lot about Canada's and the West's exposure to China's market dominance in metals and how critical minerals are needed to fight climate change and support the energy transition underway. However, unless we secure the right conditions to enable the industry to produce additional tonnages of nickel, cobalt, copper, lithium, and rare earths, as well as find, permit, and build new mines, we will fail to address both challenges. 
In fact, the new automotive investments we've attracted to Canada will be forced to rely on foreign imported feed sources, leaving Canada at greater risk of increasing its dependence on China. The past two decades have seen a sharp decline. Well. <laughs> Apologies uh, for that, and uh, apologize, uh, Mr. Grattan. Please uh, continue if you want to go back a little bit, and we we did stop the time, and we'll even add time if needed. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I was just at the point of talking about what's, hap what's happened over the last 20 years in, in the metals business, and I think it's important to note that we've seen sharp declines in Canadian production of key battery metal metals, including nickel, which is down 60% in the last 20 years. We used to be a top two producer, the top two producer in the world. We're at sixth, and cobalt. Our only lithium mine is Chinese-owned, though we do have projects advancing in the country, and new graphite projects are advancing as well. So there is new activity. Our copper production has also dropped by 40% in the past 20 years. We clearly need to turn this around. The tax credit could help. And my members, which include global leaders in critical mineral production with Canadian operations, are readying their respective project portfolios. I would stress to the committee that it's a tax credit, not a subsidy. ITCs function like rebates, and they apply only after investments have been made. These potential investments would create jobs and economic activity benefiting employees, communities, Indigenous rights holders where they operate, as well as Canadian suppliers. We have two concerns with the CM, CMI, CTM ITC as proposed. First, it's too narrow in scope. It will cover certain vehicles and equipment purchases, which on average only account for 10 to 15% of new mine expenditures. You have to keep in mind that we're, where we need to increase production in the short term is at existing mine sites, and they already have fleets of equipment uh, in place. So the benefit of this tax credit to those in the short term is much reduced. So we encourage Finance Canada to, to expand the ITC to include all mine development related costs. Mine development expenses are not a blank check. They are laid out specifically in the tax code. They require the private sector, not taxpayers, to invest billions to get more critical minerals out of the ground and then get a credit for it. This will help industry in Canada turn the dial and get the necessary critical minerals into our supply chains in the short term. Just to illustrate, one of our members has said that they have three potential new nickel pro project expansions that, if built, would increase their total Canadian production by 60%, which is huge. One project is likely to proceed regardless. However, the value of having an enhanced tax credit would put the second and third project into play. We thus welcome the decision by finance to continue to consult on this proposed tax credit over the course of this summer, an indication we hope of some openness to get this, get this right and make sure that the tax credit does the job it is intended to do, which is to incentivize the development not just of not just equipment but of new critical mineral mines. Our second concern was an original proposal to limit, to limit eligibility to projects containing 90% or more of critical mineral production. Canada is blessed with polymetallic deposits, which means we typically find copper with molybdenum and gold. 
Neither of these metals is on the list of metals eligible for the tax credit. The vast majority of copper mines and projects, including some of the most advanced, like Galore Creek in British Columbia, have less than 90% copper. Now, Finance has listened to us and Budget 2024 has proposed to eligibility, uh, a change to eligibility to 50% or more of the financial value of the out output that comes from critical minerals, and we welcome this news. Lastly, I want to comment on the renewal of the mineral expiration tax credit. Unfortunately, while renewed in late March, the increase in the inclusion rate for capital gains in Budget 2024 significantly weakened the value of the METC, and I have a feeling many of you are not aware of that. The METC raises 83% of all equity for exploration and development, and charity flow-throughs represent 89% of that 83% or 1.2 billion in 2021, most of which was directed towards critical mineral exploration. The junior exploration sector is thus almost entirely dependent today on the METC. If the rules introduced in the budget are not changed, we estimate a significant drop, possibly as high as 75% in exploration and, and development investment starting on June 21st, 25th when this comes into effect. We have raised these concerns with finance and are providing them with information they need to conduct an analysis of the impacts and possible remedies. We believe there are solutions and conversations have been positive. We are hopeful finance will act on this matter very soon so we don't compromise this year's expiration season. If not, Budget 2024 will deliver a major blow to mineral exploration at a time when we and our allies are counting on us to find more mines. I hope we can count on this committee's support for the issues I've raised today. Thank you and happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Grattan, and I'm sure the members have many questions for all of you. Uh, the first round, each party will have up to uh, six minutes. We are starting with uh, MP Calkins for the first six minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I'm gonna ask my questions to the Health Food Association. Um, thank you for your presentation. I just wanna be clear about one uh, part of your presentation where you said Health Canada. Uh, snuck these changes in Bill C-47 and uh, Bill uh, C-69. Um, actually, uh, Health Canada, when they appear at Parliament, sit uh, exactly where you're sitting right now. So actually, it would be uh, the Health Minister uh, advising the Finance Minister uh, to put these changes in this piece of legislation. Health Canada uh, w wouldn't be able to table any legislation at all. It's MPs and ministers and the government that tables these things. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about um, the Health Minister's uh, defense of using um, uh, C-47 and now C-69, um, and claiming that um, they need uh, powers uh, to uh, stop, a, a, I think, a, a particular example of a product that they're talking about. Uh, so I want to go through the, the current uh, set of powers that Health Canada has. Um, does Health Canada currently have the power to issue a stop sale on any natural health product in Canada? Thank you, Chair, for, uh, for the question. I will pass that off to uh, my colleague, Laura Gomez. Yes, Health Canada has the power I've got, I've got a lot of these, so, oh, so yes. it's just yes or no. So they yes. already have the ability. Okay. Do they have the ability to um, uh, stop personal use imports at the border if they wanted to through uh, CVSA? Yes. Do they have the ability to seize any product that they, uh, that they deem uh, necessary in order to carry out their duties and functions? Yes. Do they have the ability to revoke a site license for a manufacturer of natural health products? Yes. Do they have the ability to revoke a site license for a packager or label, labeler of natural health products? Yes, a site license packager. Literally. Yeah. Do they have the ability to revoke a site license for an importer, such as tra traditional Chinese medicine importer or anybody else for that matter? Yes, they do. Do they have the ability to mandate a label change, for example, adding health warnings to any natural health products? Yes. Do they have the ability to inspect any site license for any manufacturer, packager, labeler, or importer of natural health products? Yes. Do they have the ability to inspect any product by say, uh, taking it off the shelf and sending it to a lab for an analysis? Yes, inspectors have those powers. Does Health Canada actually approve every natural product, numbered product in Canada? Yes, they have a licensing process for all natural health products. Do they have the ability to revoke any natural product number in Canada? Yes, there are procedures to do that under the that, natural health product regulation. That is an immense amount of power. So basically, the, with the list that I've just said here, the Health Canada already has the power, uh, and they can request a, re uh, a recall if they want to as well, and I'm sure the industry complies whenever that's asked. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so, so this is a solution in search of a problem. So if it's, it's clearly not about power, because there's immense power. Health Canada already is the agency. You, you said that the judge, jury, and execute. They're also the police. 
They already have the ability to police this industry through all the powers that I just outlined. These are massive powers. So it's not about power because they already have the powers to stop any product from being on the shelf, really, if they wanted to. Yes or no? And they have the ability to stop anything at the border if they truly wanted to. Yes or no? Okay, so if it's not about power, it's obviously about something else. It's about money. Um, and the self-care framework that uh, is going to follow from this is going to do what for um, adding fees to the industry? Can you talk about uh, site licenses and product uh, uh, fees and what's coming? What's the plan? Yeah, I appreciate the question. I, I think what you're referring to is the proposals with cost recovery. And I think where we uh, connect the dots on this one is um, what we've seen with cost recovery is an example of unchecked uh, powers uh, from the minister. Um, they've gone forth and proposed a cost recovery plan uh, where they did not complete a gender-based analysis, they did not complete a risk-based analysis, they did not uh, consult with Indigenous communities, and that is what we are grappling and, and the industry is reeling from today. So the, the threat of a, a, a minister with um, uh, powers that did not go through pro proper parliamentary process and did not go through proper due diligence is, is real for this industry. As I stated at the opening, it's not hypothetical. This industry is, is dealing with it today, and that is why we have seen the groundswell from Canadians. You know, these are products by 82% of Canadians. Over 95% of Canadians deem natural health products as licensed by Health Canada as safe, and, and that is why we've seen the, the, the success of our Save Our Supplements campaign. Many businesses are claiming that they're going to shut down their operations here in Canada and move to a less a regulatory and less expensive jurisdiction. Will that make Canadian consumers... Uh, safer, uh, or will that do more for consumer protection or less for consumer protection, uh, given Canada's uh, regulatory framework versus uh, where certain products are imported from? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, we believe that it is in the best interest of Canadians to have products that are reviewed and, and licensed by Health Canada. Unfortunately, uh, with all the proposed changes, what they have not addressed is the importation from international markets, all which are unregulated and unmonitored uh, by Health Canada. Uh, so by uh, limiting the Canadian production of compliant companies and compliant products, uh, we're really pushing Canadians to purchase from unregulated and unmonitored markets, which we feel is a, a detriment to Canadians. So that's counterproductive to actual consumer protection? Correct. Okay. Um, is it true that uh, there are several jurisdictions and states in the United States of America that are currently courting, courting businesses in the natural health product space, knowing that this regula regulatory change is coming? We are aware of uh, several states which have reached out to our member companies directly, uh, proposing uh, reduced in, in, uh, tax incentives, um, and at least two of our member companies have made the decision to relocate to the U.S. Are you familiar with um, the traditional Chinese medicine uh, uh, and, and other uh, traditional medicines from other parts of the world and these organizations um, as part of your organization, um, what are they saying to you? Uh, they're extremely concerned and, and um, to be blunt, uh, they're, they're feeling quite hopeless in the, in the future that they see in being able to provide these uh, products to Canadians. Um, the conditions are just uh, so detrimental to them that they don't feel it would be viable moving forward. Thank you so much. To uh, MP Calkins and uh, now to MP uh, Baker for the next six minutes, please. Thanks very much, Chair, and thanks, thank you all very much for being here today. Um, I'm going to direct my questions to uh, to Mr. Skelton, and uh, Mr. Skelton, it's great to see you again. Um, Mr. Skelton and I have had a number of meetings on the topic we're about to talk about, and you have spoken about in our in my constituency office. Uh, Mr. Skelton's a constituent of mine, so it's great to have you here from Etobicoke in Ottawa, um, and thank you for your advocacy. Um, I just want to take a step back for, I think, for common understanding of the folks in the room, but also for, for the, for the Canadians that are watching this. Um, are natural health products sold in Canada safe? I, I appreciate the question. Um, they are safe, and and the reason we say that is Health Canada currently has a very robust regulatory framework. Uh, all products that Canadians see on shelf with a natural health product number um, have been reviewed by Health Canada. Uh, all the scientific evidence, uh, any concerns with ingredients, contraindications are reviewed and approved today by Health Canada. At any point in the life cycle of a product, when it's already on shelf and already in market, uh, Health Canada can request additional information, additional uh, scientific review if they so choose. And I think as we've already outlined, they have the, the tools uh, to remove those products that they uh, deem necessary. So Canadians should have a very high degree of confidence. And this is why uh, Canada is seen as a, or had been seen as a world leader in how we address and, and how we uh, regulate natural health products. Has there been, have there been problems that have arisen? Like that, that 
that Health Canada is, is trying to address here that needs to be that need to be addressed? Yeah, I, I think this would speak to one of the, the concerns that we've got is Health Canada has made uh, some recent attempts to uh, denigrate and, and demonize the natural health product industry uh, with um, comments around safety that are yet to be um, founded in fact. Um, in recent um, Standing Committee on Health, they have raised some concerns around safety and, and certain statistics. When we've requested and when the committee has requested the backup for that information, um, they have been un unable to supply that. Um, so uh, there are um, issues raised by Health Canada, but they're unfounded and they have yet to be substantiated. So then if, if that's the case, then what, like what, why do you think these changes are being proposed? I wish I had a simplistic answer to that, um, to, to answer it in, with a couple of different points. I think uh, our concerns is these changes will lead to um, unchecked powers of the minister. And um, those unchecked powers have, have some significant implications. Uh, and we're, we're living that through, through cost recovery right now, uh, where industry isn't consulted, uh, where Canadians aren't listened to in their concerns on how they choose to access these products and, and how they choose to incorporate them into their lives. Um, and it's resulting in an extremely concerning um, uh, impact to the small, medium, and micro-sized businesses that we represent. Um, the vast majority of businesses in this category are, are small, um, with over 80% of them falling into that category. And I think that's why we've seen uh, the groundswell from Canadians who, um, in the millions, have sent in, and I'm sure many uh, of you here today have received cards from your constituents with concerns about uh, the impact of the changes that have been proposed. So. Um, that is the basis for the, for the concern. Um, is there is there room for improvement in how we regulate natural health products in Canada? Like, is there? I'm not talking about like without getting into the specifics of what's specifically being proposed. I'm just I'm just taking a step back. Are we? You know, I know you've talked about you, you've sort of stated your position on Canada's regulatory regime as it stands today, um, but <clears throat> is there? Is there room for improvement, I think, is my question. Yeah, I think even in a world-class system, uh, there should be continued review and scrutiny on what improvements uh, could be applied. Um, I don't think we're, we're opposed to those discussions, but those discussions should be transparent. They should be done through proper analysis. They should be done through proper debate at committee, all of which has not taken place here. So uh, as an industry, we believe that the safety and the efficacy of these products is of the utmost importance, um, but achieving improvements are not done uh, through omnibus bills. They're done through proper debate, uh, which has been excluded in this process. But, but if we had, like, let's say we had that proper, that, that debate that you're describing, like I'm not, I'm not opining on what that debate should look like, but let's just, let's just I'm just taking you know, your, your testimony at, at face value. So let's say we had that process that you're describing, like, are we, are there specific things that you would say, okay, look, these are things that can be improved upon one way or the other? Yeah, I, I think there's some uh, work that could be reviewed around the, the lower risk categories of products and, and how those are reviewed, uh, some redundancies in the system that exist today, um, some overlap between different departments, um, some additional work that could be done on um, ev ev proof uh, of evidence that comes uh, through some of the, uh, the work that is done by Health Canada. So there's always ways to streamline the system. I think there is some inefficiencies currently in the system, which is one of our bigger concerns with the cost recovery process, uh, is it doesn't account for the necessity of some of those improvements. Uh, we live in a modern world, and you know, we're not embracing some modern solutions uh, to some of the administrative works that happen. So uh, there will always be opportunities for, for improvements. Chair, what's, what's my time? You have uh, 20 seconds. 20 seconds. I think, uh, I think I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, uh, MP Baker. And now to uh, MP Saint-Marie, please. Oui, good morning. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chair. Hello, colleagues. Thank you to all of the witnesses for joining us and for your testimony. We see that there are some very concerning issues on three completely divergent issues. My, the majority of my questions will be for Mr. Brun from Desjardins Group. Thank you for your your testimony, you are suggesting that you with, withdraw a section of the bill to avoid a false start. Why, in your opinion, is it important to, to adopt an open banking framework? Thank you for the question, sir. Well, it's essential because currently we need to know that what we call open banking 
already exists in, in actuality. It's simply not subject to a framework. So we un you un understand how you could exp be exposed and, and can how Canadian ex consumers could be exposed to risks. It's important that there needs, there, there needs to be a framework that will also encourage innovation. And Desjardins Group is fully in favour of that innovation, and I think that all of the financial sector is as well. Now, the success of the framework will depend on the adoption. People need to adopt this new framework and use it. And they will use it if it is safe, if, if it is accessible, and if it offers the best conditions. Currently, The foundations proposed in the bill say, well, we will establish a framework that applies to federally regulated financial institutions, but then there will be an opt-in that will perhaps create double regulation, and that's counterproductive. Provincial financial institutions will be facing a, a, a real dilemma. Either they adopt it and they ask to be accredited at the federal level, and then they are disadvantaged on they're not on a level playing field it's really a matter of everybody needs to be on the same footing at the beginning or they need to withdraw from this if they withdraw from it that means that there's screen scraping so that means that there are entities that will seek out data within financial institutions without following the rules and the framework, and that can result in risks. So it's really important to have a framework that can be developed, but that is built on a solid foundation. I will wrap up on this. We would invite all committee members, you certainly have fina provincial financial institutions in your ridings in Quebec and in all provinces in Canada. Ask them what they think about this. How do they see this framework? And how do they feel about double regulation? Do they think that they are equipped to really benefit their members and their consumers? Thank you. The framework as presented by the Minister of Finance, if it is adopted, what would be the impact on Desjardins members? The decision that was made by the government was not fully explained. I know that the FCAC was designated by the government, and they'll come and testify before you. I invite you to ask them some questions about where this decision comes from to send this to send the responsibility of the framework to that agency. It doesn't really have expertise on it either. It doesn't have uh, expertise on cybersecurity and data management. So for, for Desjardins group, particularly in provincial institutions, we are finding ourselves in a, in a, in a situation where there's a double regulation and so what we're doing it's well com comp competitiveness will be harmed and the risks will increase for clients and members of a financial institution that falls under provincial jurisdiction for us the solution is very simple it is really to withdraw it's not a large bill within the in the scale of the omnibus bill we're talking about 12 or 13 pages but take the time to discuss it and align it with provincial counterparts so that we can ensure that it applies to everyone we fully support an innovative framework that will have uh, guardrails and allow us to create a safe situation otherwise it's a bit of a pandora's box that will be opened that's concerning. During the testimony in the Senate on this bill, uh, governance was talked about a lot. Why is governance so important? They're the very foundation of the financial system. That's what decides how we establish standards, yes, but also how we manage security and act within all of the financial institutions in Canada, we have a, f a federal system which has its advantages and its disadvantages. Currently, the approach is very limited. 
we have an approach what that says, well, we'll establish a framework for federal institutions and come join us. So it's a framework that's partial and imperfect, and it exposes us to a lot of risks in the financial in inst network. We need solid foundations to I would remind you, discussions have been ongoing for years on this, for six or eight years now. A few weeks more won't make a big difference. We know that this is the second, second budget omnibus bill and is coming in fall, and I think we need to get things right. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. St. Marie. Now to MP Davies, please. Thank you. Um, well, just um, at the outset, I would just like to, to to note that the witnesses are commenting on, I think, an important theme about the problems of omnibus, the use of budget bills for omnibus uh, purposes. Uh, this was used extensively by the Conservatives under the Harper government, where who uh, who brought in um, very very large omnibus bills. Um, making the finance committee have to deal with issues in everything from you know, the regulation of waterways to health products, and those those issues were not able to go to the right committee or to bring the right stakeholders before to fully scrutinize them. I think in 2015 that the, the Trudeau government promised that they would not use omnibus bills, um, and here we are today in 2024 with the same problem. So I think that's an important structural observation that uh, I think needs to be put on the record and every government of every hue needs to I think pay heed to this because it's problematic from a legislative point of view. Um, Mr. Skelton, uh, I think I got this answer but I just wanted to ask you, did Health Canada consult with the Canadian Health Food Association or its members on the proposed changes to the Food and Drugs Act in Division 31? No, they did not. Now, yesterday at this committee, the Associate Assistant Deputy Minister of Health Canada's Health Products and Food Branch said that the Supplementary Rules Authority proposed in Division 31 is, quote, really for those situations where there's intentional misuse or diversion of a product to a use that's completely outside of health. Uh, two quick questions on that. Um, it, does Health Canada not have the power to deal with that situation now? And second, is that how you interpret uh, the this section of the legislation. Uh, thank you for the question. I will uh, defer to Ms. Gomez. Thank you. Currently, to answer the first part of the question, currently Health Canada does have powers under the licensing for natural health products to include information uh, about the safe use of products. Uh, that includes statements such as uh, for external use only, for a product that is not intended to be ingested, or for products that should be kept away from children. Um, on the second part of the question, the interpretation of this section is concerning because of some of the exemptions that have been included in the drafting. And while the statements from Health Canada express their intent, that intent is written in the legislation itself. Um, the legislation itself is much more broad. Um, it talks generally to unintended use. And then it also allows for an exemption that if, if there's in, if Health Canada has any uncertainty respecting the risk to health and safety um, about that unintended use, that they can nonetheless still make an order. So that takes away a lot of the scientific scrutiny and rigor that would normally be applied to the use of such powers. Mm -hmm. um, now, looking at uh, the actual sections of, of this division, uh, I'm, I'm, I want to zero in on the test. It says subject to any regulations made under paragraph 31 J1, if the minister believes that the use of a therapeutic product other than the intended use may present a risk of injury to health, the minister may, and then of course it's established rules on the conditions. Uh, I'm just wondering how you feel about the, the subjective belief test. Uh, do you think that that's a proper and appropriate measure that would uh, apply to potentially removing products off uh, away from consumers or should there be some objective standard imported into that section? 
sub anytime there's a subjective provision in legislation that is problematic because it is interpreted to be the intent that the legislation is permitting uh, someone to make a subjective determination. Um, in this case, it's particularly concerning because of the exemption uh, for uncertainty. So th that means that if, if there is uncertainty as to whether or not there even is a health risk, that, that someone could still make a decision that would have very sweeping powers, and in fact, a decision to control or remove a product from market where that product has already gone through the proper regulatory approval process that's already provided for in the regulations. Would you support an amendment to the section or would it give you more comfort? I understand your position is to delete the section, but if it were to be there, if, if the section were amended to uh, provide a condition of reasonable grounds, so for instance, if the minister believes on reasonable grounds, uh, that the therapeutic product, would that give you more comfort? In that provision, yes, but I also think that the the subsection on uncertainty, again, is very problematic because even if that provision says that there's reasonable grounds, um, those reasonable grounds can be based on uncertainty, and that uncertainty um, can mean that there is no actual health to risk to health and safety. I was uh, speaking with... Uh, traditional Chinese medicine practitioners this week who um, make extensive use of herbal-based compounds, they are also most concerned that these sections are so broadly defined uh, that they could be used to restrict their prescribed treatments. Have you had any conversation or do you have any input connection with the traditional Chinese medicine community? Uh, yes, we have uh, spoken extensively with that uh, that community. I, I think you're representing, um, similar to our conversations, their, their deep concern. Uh, I think any any uh, class of products that is used in in such a uh, based on such a traditional modality and in, in application and in, in base of, of use uh, would see these as particularly troubling. You know, I, I, I think listening to media and listening to Health Canada yesterday, it appears that what Health Canada really wants to get at are two things. They want to get at the use of nicotine pouches and the misuse of the tobacco industry instead of using them for smoking cessation, sort of marketing them or allowing them to be sold to children for, for recreational use or young people. And the second thing is, I think, uh, when we had the shortage of, of infant formula, and I think we had that for children's um, pain medication as well, would you would you support admit targeted amendments to legislation? Uh, of course, it shouldn't be in a budget act, but uh, that actually speak to those specific situations as opposed to a broad power that appears to be able to be used against any product in any circumstance under subjective belief and without even requiring certainty. Yes, I think we would support uh, precision regulation that it, that is directed specifically at the issues. Um, our, again, our concern here is the the, the broad sweeping powers that are that are um, uh, particularly apt to be uh, used in a way that is not appropriate. Um, but there are methods and ways to adapt to the you know the current regulations to target those issues that you highlighted, and we would be supportive of that. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, how am I doing? That, that's the time, that's actually. Time. Yeah, we've gone over, but uh, we are into Thank our you. second round, and what we're going to do here, because we don't have enough time for a full second round, it'll be about three to four minutes for each party that uh, will have uh, to ask questions. We're starting with MP Morantz for those three to four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Skelton, I just wanted to sort of bring this back to what the direct effect might be on consumers, because we haven't talked about that. So. You know, someone goes into a store presuming that the, this regulation came into effect exactly as it is, which is something that you don't want to see. Uh, somebody goes into a store after that happens and to pick up their regular monthly bottle of vitamin C that maybe they pay $10 now for or something like that. What will this do with all the licensing fees that are ha have to be paid on an annual basis? What will that do to the cost of their product? Not uh, particular to C69, but in, in a similar vein of an unchecked uh, ministerial power, that's what we're seeing on cost recovery. And I, and I think uh, what I'd, I'd um, comment on is uh, through our analysis, what we've seen um, on um, the impact of several of these regulatory and legislative updates 
is uh, at, at minimum one in five of these Canadian brands are looking to exit the country. So it's going to reduce the number of Canadian produced and Canadian regulated products that are available. The companies that do remain are going to be reducing uh, the assortment of products because they're just not financially viable anymore. So the selection of products will be reduced for Canadians. Mm -hmm. And the products that remain will have a, a increased cost burden that is um, uh, extremely um, uh, different uh, than, than international um, uh, countries. And so we'll see an increase of cost of those that remain on. So yeah. less Canadian compliant, less assortment, and increased costs for those that do remain. So someone could walk into the store to pick up, say, say it's cold and flu season and echinacea works for them. They could walk into a store and find out that echinacea is no longer available, for example. That might be one example. Yeah. Some of those uh, products unavailable, and those that do remain uh, could uh, be impacted by upwards of 20 to 40 percent on shelf. Yeah. And what, what's the reason for this legislation? Like how, how much in fees and revenues does the government expect to collect, assuming this comes into place? Uh, so the cost recovery re proposal uh, is estimated at about $51 uh, million, which is a complete recovery of the existing yeah. budget. Um, and that's what uh, the cost recovery plan has been based so, on. So, I mean, this year the entire federal budget has just reached $500 billion for the first time. So, like, I haven't done the math yet, but, I mean, $50 million is like a, a rounding error for the government, but the inconvenience it's causing to consumers would be huge. Am I correct in that assessment? Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Uh, the, the budget that Canada uses to regulate natural health products is actually the largest budget anywhere in the developed world on, to manage natural health products. So we already have the largest bureaucracy overseeing the regulation of natural health products. Yeah. So the result of this will be $50 million to the federal government, less product availability for consumers, and higher cost to consumers for the products that remain. I think that's a fair conclusion. Okay. Thank you. Right, thank you, uh, MP Moritz. Uh, I've got now MP Thompson, please. Okay, oh, sorry, uh, P.S. Turnbull. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, so, Mr. Bill, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions um, with the limited time. I think I have about four minutes. Is that what you said? Three to four minutes. Okay. Um, I want to ask you about the uh, Indigenous Loan Guarantee Program because I think this is going to make a significant contribution to... Uh, ensuring that First Nations, um, who have often been kind of sidelined when it comes to natural resources, natural resource projects, uh, specifically in the mining sector, they haven't been able to get access to competitively priced capital uh, to um, participate in, in those projects in a meaningful way that, uh, that achieves economic returns for, for their community members. Can you speak to how the Indigenous Loan program included in Budget 2024 will, uh, you know, further encourage, enable, and, and support that participation in, in the mining industry? Yeah, in my limited time remarks, I did smoke, focus on, on, on two other issues, um, but certainly the Indigenous Loan Guarantee is, uh, program is, or fund is something that we strongly support. Uh, and encourage the government to uh, to to proceed with. I I would though like to challenge a little bit the sort of your your preamble. Um, we the participation of Indigenous peoples in the mining sector, including in in business procurement, is extensive already. Um, I could take an example of Boise's Bay, where I think ninety percent of all procurement is with Indigenous-owned businesses. So it's it's huge in the. The, the territories, it's 30, 40 percent. It's so there's a lot of participation in mining. Um, maybe just, but there could be I know more. I, I yeah. don't mean to be disrespectful, yeah. but I have limited time and yeah. I do have another question for you. But in terms of equity, uh, ownership, shares in those projects, I'm sure we can all agree that First Nations haven't been able to participate to the same degree that they are now with this Indigenous loan program in place. That is true and that is a, is a welcome development and I'd also emphasize what we like about the program. It's not just exclusively the opportunity to become, you know, part owners in mines, but also all of the ancillary, ancillary activities, whether it's a power line, whether it's a road. There's lots that goes into the building of a mine that they can have a direct stake in through this program and that's a very positive development. 
Thank you. I wanted to ask you another question. It's a bit of a, an aside, but I'm, I'm contemplating how we can link programs like the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance. Could you, uh, do you are you aware of that program? It's an international one that uh, looks for um, sort of certifying socially and environmentally responsible mining projects. How many projects in Canada would qualify for the IRMA currently? Zero. Um, because in Canada, we have another program called Ford Sustainable Mining, which was developed by our association, um, which is a condition of membership and is applied at all of our member mine sites in Canada and many around the world. It is actually the largest sustainability initiative in mining in terms of its application uh, globally. We have 12 other countries in the world that are currently applying that standard. Okay, and so there's two investment tax credits in this that apply to the extractives industry mining projects in general. There's the clean tech manufacturing tax credit and the uh, mineral exploration tax credit. Uh, so both of those, I would assume, are welcome developments, notwithstanding some of your comments at the beginning about some design issues that you have with those, you know, perhaps being worked out. Um, so you see those as positive developments in Budget 2024 as enhancing the uh, both exploration but also the development of new mining projects in Canada? Uh, well, the, 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 the clean manufacturing tax credit is definitely a welcome development. That addresses a, a gap in the value chain that existed within the cri critical mineral strategy. So it certainly will help to support new mining development. Uh, and so we applaud it. We do think it needs to go further in terms of what it what applies to. The METC has been around uh, for 20-odd years. This year's, and the government renewed it in March, but this year's budget actually, from what I can gather, inadvertently put a spike through it, and it needs to be fixed. Time. Thank you. And uh, now we'll be going to uh, MP Samari, please. We miss. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, a comment. Concerning the open banking part of the legislation, what we see is Finance Canada that has once again created a system that it, that gives an advantage to Bay Street and uh, harms uh, credit unions, co-ops, and everything under provincial jurisdiction. Am I surprised? No, but for me, it's unacceptable. Now, my question, I'll come back to Mr. Brun. If there was a recognition of the provincial framework, could that ensure better cohesiveness for all consumers across Canada? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I would say absolutely. That's the way forward, I would say. The minister testified before your committee and also in front of the Senate, and I noted the expression that she used. She talked about cohesive experience for all consumers. So there, yes, there needs to be an alignment with provincial frameworks so that there is a cohesive experience for everyone and not a double regulation. Yes, so as you said, there is the starting line and then there's the big Bay Street banks that have the advantage. And then there are financial institutions like yours that are lagging behind and are stuck with this framework. So it does not respect the idea of the cohesive experience and reciprocity of standards. Do you have anything else to raise for the committee? Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to... Uh, to flesh this out, as I mentioned earlier, for for years now we've been talking about opening banking and and increasing competition, because the the goal is to offer more services, and that is why I'm talking so much about the importance of a solid foundation, that financial institutions can start at the same time to develop themselves. You know that is the very basis on which we built. We talk about consumer-based banking services, and then we talk about payment, and that, of course, we will 
broaden into the insurance sector. So having a solid foundation that allows us to develop this is the only guarantee for success. Thank you. I think Mr. Sorbara can't hear us, but his microphone is open. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, MP Sorbara, just if you could just check that your micro microphone is on mute. Yep, and you may continue for another question, uh, MP Samari. Oui, très bien. Yes, thank you. So I was very surprised to see that it was the FCAC that was chosen to be responsible for the framework. To my knowledge, it's not a large institution. There it has an interim director, and it's particularly focused on education. Do you have fears about FCOC's ability to properly regulate the matters, the expertise necessary for matters of risks related to data management and cybersecurity. Thank you for the question. It's a very important one because we're talking about the stability of the financial sector. You know, in Canada, we there are fewer players, but there's a lot of stability, and we want to increase and op grow and increase the uh, sector, And we, but we don't want it to be to the detriment of the stability of the system and security. We were particularly surprised when we learned about this. For years now, we've been talking about open banking, and that and it was there there was an, it was no there was never a question of sending it to this agency that has never managed this type of data that doesn't have the expertise they say they will develop it but you understand this is a a complex issue there are risks involved and there needs to be a lot of rigor and we have a lot of doubt about this there are some signals being sent because consumer protection is currently a provincial jurisdiction so now there's a, a a dual problem. They need to build expertise and there's also the federal provincial component and it needs to be done cohesively so that everyone can get on board. Th thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. St. Marie. For, uh, for this uh, panel will be uh, MP Davies for three to four minutes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Skelton, that we've touched on this a bit. I want to be clear. Canadians are currently permitted to bring a personal use quantity of a natural health product into the country without requ requiring special licenses for the import. They often do that over the internet and with Amazon delivering that sort of thing. Do you expect that consumers will be more likely to import products from foreign jurisdictions if the regulatory changes proposed by Health Canada uh, are go through in this budget? I do think it's a reasonable assumption given the proposed impact will be less assortment increased cost given the current um, economic environment that Canadians will seek to use the internet. Uh, it is the modern age and people are see seeking information on the products they take but also the products themselves. And so our concern is that without addressing that import uh, piece uh, that we'll be leaving Canadians procuring products that don't have uh, the regulatory in uh, oversight that they do on Canadian made and licensed products. Thanks. And Ms. Gomez, um, you touched on this as well. Besides the, the, the three major provisions which would uh, give the minister, if, if he has a subjective belief that there's a problem with off-label use or the, the use of, of medic uh, products that are um, um, approved for use uh, for animals being used for humans, and then the ability to exempt products completely, there is this section that says the minister may make the order despite any uncertainty respecting the risk of adverse effects that the use of the drug, including a use other than the intended use, may present. Um, what, what kind of test um, or provision would you prefer or suggest should be in legislation like this, or do you, uh, do you think that this uncertainty test is appropriate? The uncertainty test is extremely broad and, and it avoids the scientific rigor that is already in place for products that are licensed in Canada through the regula health regulatory making process. So for that standard, the similar standard that would be appropriate would be for the other powers that are already in the Food and Drugs Act, and that is that there is a serious or imminent health risk, or even that there is a, a risk or even injury to health or that it may have a risk of injury to health. Um, that drafting um, is reasonable. There are there may be stakeholders 
other parties who are concerned about that from past experience. Um, however, I think the addition of this uncertainty clause really um, takes away from the basic requirement that there be an actual risk to health and safety before uh, the minister can take action to remove a product mm -hmm. from market or, or make other changes. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, the, as you've pointed out, the government wants the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada to be the uh, the body that implements the open banking provisions. Um, the UK created a fit for purpose entity called the Open Banking Implementation Entity, and I've spoken to some some stakeholders in the industry that believe it's more appropriate to have a fit for purpose uh, entity created to implement open banking provisions. Is that something that you would support? Thank you for the question. Absolutely something that, that we would support. Uh, having, uh, because open banking is clearly, you know, it's, it's quite transversal, it covers a lot, it, it's hard to mix it fit, and clearly, well, the government wanted and looked around what uh, was already in place and what was available to, to, to host that. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's not necessarily the, the best way. So your suggestion, yes, is uh, absolutely something where, at the same time, federal government and, and provincial, uh, you know, uh, regulator could could step in and pitch in. It's it's the way to to go. Okay, thank you, so and, and th that that is the time. Thank, thank you, you, MP Davies. I know it goes fast, and uh, but we do want to uh, to thank our witnesses for joining us here in Ottawa. It's it's a it's a beautiful uh, Friday morning, and uh, thank you for coming before us on uh, C sixty nine. We really appreciate uh, your testimony. We want you to have the and you know the best for the rest of the day. So thank you very much. On that, we're suspended, uh, members. As we we are uh, we're we're back. And uh, we have our uh, second uh, panel with us now, and we're looking forward to, uh, to hearing from them and who's with us. We've got the, uh, the Canadian Teachers Federation uh, and its president, Heidi Yetman. Welcome, uh, Ms. Yetman. Uh, from the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada, the Deputy Commissioner of Supervision and Enforcement, Frank LaFranco is with us. We have also have Deputy Commissioner of Research Policy and Education, Supriya Sile, and Interim Commissioner, Chief Financial Officer and Assistant Commissioner of Corporate Services, Werner Liebke. Okay, and our third uh, witness uh, group here is the University of Ottawa and uh, Professor of Faculty of Law, Professor Stuart Elgy. Welcome, Professor Elgy. And on that, we are going to start with the Canadian Teachers uh, Federation and its president, uh, Ms. Yetman, please. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for having the Canadian Teachers Federation here to speak to Bill C-69 and bring the perspective of teachers in Canada to the study of the legislature, legislation. The Federation uh, is an organization that represents over 365,000 K-12 public education teachers and education workers in Canada, and we proudly represent members in every province and territory. And I'm here to speak to the positive uh, things in Bill 69 for education. Uh, as the cost of living crisis continues to hit Canadians hard, teachers and their families are no different. And that's why we, when we met the Minister of Finance earlier this year to discuss issues of affordability and cost-saving measures that would benefit teachers and their families, we had three clear asks. The creation of a national school food program, federal loan forgiveness for teachers, and more resources for mental health. The pandemic has negatively impacted the mental health of students and young people, and students' academic success is linked to their well-being. This budget has more resources to be dedicated to addressing mental health concerns within youth communities in Canada. We know that mental health is sadly becoming a more and more prevalent cost for families, and we called on the federal government to find a way to make sure the government seeks to alleviate barriers to mental health supports, especially for those who find them inaccessible. And we are pleased to see that the government pledged $500 million over five years for a new youth mental health fund designed to help younger Canadians access health care. 
With student mental health issues on the rise, classrooms are becoming more and more complex, and as a result, working conditions are deteriorating, and consequently, teachers are leaving the profession. In addition, student populations are growing, and unfortunately, fewer people are enrolling in education faculties and university. And this has resulted in a retention and recruitment crisis in education in this country, especially in remote and rural communities. Uh, the Federation pointed out a way that the federal government could, could make uh, entering teaching a more enticing and viable career path using loan forgiveness. This initiative would mean the loan forgiveness of thousands of dollars for teachers in communities that already have a difficult time recruiting. I cannot state enough how significant of an investment this is into public education and making the lives of teachers and their fam families more for affordable. Did you know that in 2022, one in four Canadian children were food insecure in Canada? That, that really is something if you think about it. So we asked for the creation of a national food program, a program that we have long called for and felt was long overdue. And after a decade of advocacy, we are thrilled and relieved to hear the announcement of an investment of $1 billion over five years. Uh, this is wonderful news for us and many other organizations who have advocated for years and years and years for a food school program. Uh, taking pressure off of parents and families by providing nutritious meals for school aged children at school is something collectively Canada should be excited and proud about. This will have a life changing impact on the lives of children and families living in Canada. Putting food on the lunchroom table at school will improve student physical and mental health, improve their abilities to fully participate in their education, and improve relationships at school. And research shows that universal food programs provide a 2.5 to 7 times return in human health and economic benefits. So I'm really pleased that Bill C-69 has made investments into each of these three key, key areas that will have an impact on education. You know, education is the foundation of a healthy and prosperous society, and spending money on education and youth is not a cost, but it's an investment. So thank you very much. Thanks, yeah, man. Uh, now we'll hear from the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada, and I believe it's Mr. Litke that will be delivering remarks. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. S Chair, for, th for the introduction, and to the committee for inviting us to appear before you today. My name is Werner Litke. I am the Interim Commissioner of the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada, or the FCIAC. I am joined by Frank LaFranco, Deputy Commissioner, Supervision and Enforcement, and by Dr. Supriya Siao, Deputy Commissioner, Research, Policy and Education. The FCFC is an independent federal agency that protects the rights and interests of consumers of financial products and services. At the FCFC, we are happy that the financial well-being of Canadians is such an important part of Budget 2024. Budget 2024 contained several important initiatives of note for our agency, including a new role and an expanded mandate to oversee, administer and enforce Canada's consumer-driven banking framework. The FCFC is a leader and innovator in financial consumer protection and is well positioned to take on this new responsibility. Working closely with the Department of Finance to advance a consumer driven banking framework which prioritizes innovation and includes strong and consistent protections for Canadians who will use consumer driven banking. The new framework is guided by three objectives safety and soundness to protecting the financial well-being of Canadians and advancing economic growth and international competitiveness. 
While the Department of Finance leads on policy and legislative and regulatory development for this framework, Budget 2024 proposes 